thank you for joining us to worship God today. Today we're going to start with uh, Proverbs 15, coming from the NIV. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. A fool spurns a parent's discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. The house of the righteous contain great treasure, but the income of the wicked bring ruin. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, but the hearts of fools are not upright. The Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. The Lord detests the way of the wicked, but he loves those who pursue righteousness. Stern discipline awaits anyone who leaves the path. The one who hates correction will die. Death and destruction lie open before the Lord. How much more do, do human hearts? Mockers resent correction, so they avoid the wise. A happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. The discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of the fool feeds on folly. All the days of the oppressed are, are wicked, wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual feast. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth and turmoil. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. Better uh, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. The way of a sluggard is blocked with thorns, but the path of the upright is the highway. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly brings joy to one who has no sense, but whoever has understanding keeps a straight course. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. A person finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word. The path of life leads upward for the prudent to keep them from going down to the realm of death. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but he sets the window's boundary stone in place. The Lord detests the thought of the wicked, but gracious words are pure in his sight. The greedy bring ruin to their households, but the one who hates bribes with life. The heart of the righteous weighs in answer, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Light in messenger's eyes brings joy to the heart, and good news gives health to the bones. Whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Those who disregard discipline despise himself, but the one who heeds correction gains understanding. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. I heard a saying when I was a kid. I've heard it throughout different times in my life from different people. Most recently, I've been hearing this on the radio from a guy by the name of Phil Williams. That's a talk show. And it most often comes up when somebody disagrees with what he's saying. A year or so ago, I, I heard it again, and it kind of stuck in my mind. And usually when the dis disagreement can't be solved and you know that you're going to disagree, he'll end the conversation. Brother, I love you, and there's not a thing you can do about it. <laughs> you know, about a year ago, I started trying to apply that in my mind. When I get into a disagreement with somebody and knew that it just was not going to end where it needed to be, I'd say, in my mind, I love them, and there's not a thing I can do about it, or they can do about it. 
changed my attitude. Well, I kind of got to think about it again here most recently. And as I read this this morning, I, I thought about it. And I tried and tried and tried to figure out where that came from. You know, in my mind, I've always thought, you know, that's something Jesus would say. I think it's, a, I think it's probably the way he lived his life. Because he did. He loved us, and there's not a thing we can do about it. He loved us so much that he died on the cross and gave up his life so we could live with him. You know, there's not much more love than that. And if we, as Christians, as we try to follow him, if we will go into it with that attitude, it may help us all get along a little bit better. But you know, even though we don't, I don't know who first said it, as I was preparing this morning, I think that probably I could look at this and when I try to paraphrase it, I could almost say that Proverbs 15 is that same way. God loved us so much. Hey, no matter what we do, He still loves us. Let's pray as we open up our service this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful morning that, uh, that we get to enjoy your love, your creation. Lord, we thank you for allowing us the help to help. We can come out and visit the black Christians that we can share with one another opening up your word, to hear your word proclaimed, and to apply it to our lives. Lord, we thank you that we have that opportunity, not only to learn about your love, but to share it with others. Lord, we pray that as we go into service this morning, that uh, everything we do brings honor and glory to your name, for it is in your Son, Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. This morning we'll begin our time of praise together with hymn 213. It's a chorus, and we'll have the words up on the screen. Now, I noticed uh, uh, Scott was reading out of the Proverbs of the day. All right, now, I, we talked about that. I, it's, a, it's an idea that's been around long before me and my time that uh, if you are looking for something to read in the Word of God, as we should try to do each day, if you're struggling, you can always go for the Proverbs of the day. But as a part of my upbringing and training, whether I'm struggling or not, I still think it's good to read the Proverbs of the day. Did you hear all the wisdom that came from each verse? I think that's a wonderful, wonderful way to start a worship service. And I'm going to throw this out there. Something we're going to continue to do from here on out is start our worship time together with a reading of Scripture. Sometimes it'll be Scott, and sometimes it'll be one of you. Now, I'm not going to recruit. Don't worry, everybody calm down. I'm not going to recruit. But most of you have my cell phone or email. It's in the bulletin. If you'd be interested, I will recruit after a couple of months if I don't get some names. Uh, well, I already talked to my kids, and some of them are interested in doing it. So... Uh, anybody, all ages, if you'd be interested, what would happen is a week before the Sunday, I would give you a piece of paper. It would simply say, you would get up here and say, welcome to Mountain View Church of Christ. We're going to begin with a reading from Psalm 13 or Proverbs 10. And you're going to read and help us start out with worship. And at the end, you'd say, uh, and, and now uh, if you'd please uh, stand as we have a time of worship and the worship minister would come up. So if you're interested in just reading scripture, you don't have to come up with anything to say. Uh, you would just be sharing, doing a scripture reading for us. So think about it. You got my phone, you got my email, and I'd like to see more faces up here, wouldn't you? I mean, I like the faces we have. Uh, some of you did not say yes to that. You don't want to see more. We need, let me rephrase that. We need more faces up here because we've got good faces already up here. We've got people, I love that, you know, we've got uh, wonderful people helping out. But if we're really a church that does discipleship, we are training others and we are demonstrating by what we do that this church is helping other people gain confidence in the Word of God, Right? All right, enough said. Let's go ahead and stand, if you will, if you're physically able as we sing. We're going to sing this chorus twice in a row, hymn 213, We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise.
sing our next hymn, all three verses of There is a Redeemer, inspired from thoughts like we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Christ Jesus has become our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. We're not here to get numbers on a board. Although that's a part of what we do, why we are here is to worship Christ. We are here to declare to the world that drives by and sees all the vehicles in the parking lot, there's a Redeemer. We've gathered to worship. All three verses, hymn 308, there is a Redeemer. Accept him as our Lord and Savior, he gives worth to us. Isn't that wonderful? First Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he what? Cares for, cares for you. Do you believe? Do you believe this morning that Jesus cares for you? I, I believe he cares for me. I believe he cares for you as well. Let's use this time as we prepare for communion. Hymn 496. 
all three verses of no one ever cared for me like Jesus. Think about him on the cross. Yes, think about him buried and resurrected, but think about him on the cross and that sacrifice for us as we sing all three verses. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true. change the ways that we act and we change the ways that we think choosing a hunger and a thirst for righteousness we make that good confession in public when we decide to follow Jesus and then we're baptized where our old self dies in that watery grave and we are raised in a new life in Christ we then make a commitment a lifelong commitment to follow him while we're in the church, we mature spiritually together. We minister to one another during the different seasons of life. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and mourn with those who mourn. We worship and we pray together. We fellowship and we learn together. Today as we come around the Lord's table, we remember Jesus' death and his resurrection together. Let's go to God in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, just now that we have this opportunity to come together around this, your table, to take time to remember the sacrifice that you made for us, both individually 
and as a family. Lord, uh, we ask that uh, forgive us where we fall short. Lord, let us take stock of our lives, come to you, that we can commune around this your table and partake of this loaf that represents your body that was broken and this juice that represents the blood that was shed on our behalf that you took all of our sin upon you so that we could not only commune with you around your table but that we could live with you in heaven forever we ask that you bless this to the to the remembrance of what you did for us. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. God is called the what in James chapter 1, 17? Father. And in him there is no shadow of turning. And so th this offering time isn't about Mountain View Church of Christ and its needs. This time isn't about any of us and our ability to give. It is about what God has blessed us with and what we are able to bless others with. It's about generosity. It's about obedience. It's about tithing for some. It's about offering for others. It's about giving as the Lord has directed you and called you to give. And I could do a missions moment this morning and share one of the missions. We've done that in times past. But this morning, I wanted to keep the focus on God this morning. This, this time of offering is about offering to God. And I know that may be hard to visualize when you're putting a, a church's name on a check or it's going in a bucket uh, that, that belongs to an institution, but the goal of this institution and ministry is to do everything we do for the glory of God. That's not just a cliche. That is honestly what we do. That's our priority. That's what we hold each other accountable to do. So as you give, as you're led, there, there is a, a bucket in the back, and you can uh, give that way or some uh, send things in the mail if that's what you're led to do. And there are financial reports that are issued, and if you ever have any questions about what this church does with its finances, we're very transparent and open about that and happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I just say give as the Lord leads you to give. Let's pray a blessing over the offering. Heavenly Father, You have always met our needs. 
even when there are seasons where we do without, you've met our needs. As the Apostle Paul said, we've learned how to live in times of plenty and how to live in times of drought. But Lord, you've always met our needs. You've always provided in unique ways. And we want to take after you. We want to imitate your generous personality. Pass that along to others in and out of the church. We want to be the church. We both want to support what it what a ministry like this does, and we also want to be generous outside these church walls as you prompt us to give. May we just have an attitude of uh, gratefulness for what you provided for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now this morning at this point, we've got an opportunity uh, uh, for uh, TT's going to be taking, what? Christy, Christy's going to be taking uh, uh, kiddos who are uh, four-year-old and under, and then we've got uh, five-year-old and up are going to go with Miss Heidi. So we got Children's Church all the way up to uh, fifth grade, and uh, they'll be downstairs if uh, that's uh, the kids are now free to go. All right, here we go. Now something I, I noticed last week is I kind of went for my usual 15-minute. 20 minute sermon goal, right? If I have a 15 minute goal, I'm probably going to preach 22 minutes. Well, and you say, Mike, I don't want to hear any more about how long you preach. Well, it's, it's, yeah, I think there's some importance into making sure the truth and stories we share get to the point and keep the main thing the main thing. But when I looked up last Sunday, it was 10 37 a.m. and I was done. And I went, they just started teaching the kids downstairs. This is not going to go well. <laughs> And so we adapted and we continued to worship and learn. But I think it's exciting that downstairs we've had children's ministries going on. But as that continues to expand and grow, uh, I, I want to make sure that we're, we are giving the kids enough time to learn the same messages and the same uh, gospel-centered biblical message that we're going to have. It's not going to be the same lesson necessarily, but we are going to be learning from the same Word of God. And I'm glad that uh, the kids, just like they have been, are going to continue learning the Word of God in their own age bracket. I think that's a blessing. We can't take that for granted. This morning up here, we're going to be in the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 31, verses 35 through 40. You can follow along in your own Bibles. we got them in the pews. We'll have the verses up on the screens, whatever works for you. Um, Job is a tough story, and this whole series has been dedicated to finding joy in suffering. And right now, just in talking to people this week and this morning, uh, the angst is building again. Because we're wondering, as the, uh, as the COVID Delta variant, I'm just going to say it because it's a, it's a hot discussion right now, right here in Blount County. I've got friends uh, who are being hospitalized right now with this. Uh, I've also got friends who are living their entire life in fear because of this. And somewhere in the middle... You, you need to be wise, but you also uh, need to be bold. These kinds of things are always going to be around. I think we need to follow precautions with our own wisdom and application and give each other the grace and space to walk in freedom with our Savior as we see fit. Does that make sense? I, I think if we vilify somebody because they want to get a shot, is irresponsible and unchristlike. I think to vilify somebody because they don't want to get a shot is irresponsible and unchristlike. I, I, I know we don't want to get political, and I don't believe this is a political discussion at this point. I believe it is honestly a discussion that's hitting your families and mine, is it not? And i got to tell you, I, I was not sent here to this earth. I was not born for the purpose of giving praise to a specific political party or political agenda. That's not why I was created, neither were you. If you were, I'd recommend you meet Christ instead. Our goal should be to lift up Jesus Christ, and if our brothers and sisters disagree about some of these non-eternal issues, so what? Get over it. Move on. Move on. Our focus should be on bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to earth because COVID or no COVID, was there suffering before this stupid virus came along? Will there be suffering after it's gone? Then I think our focus should be on the gospel of hope of Jesus Christ bringing hope to any and all kind of suffering. The suffering that comes from making personal 
poor decisions, the suffering that comes from a disease you couldn't do anything about, the suffering that comes from financial stress and burden, the suffering that comes from living in a world of sin, sickness, and death. That should be our focus, and that's the focus here in Job chapter 31. We're going to listen to Job. Most of the book of Job is a monologue of misery. Job is just sharing how tough his life is and the suffering that he's in, and yet he is sharing the joy of Christ. That should be our goal, not arguing about vaccination cards and social distancing and masks or no masks. Uh, have those discussions and make your own informed opinion and, and conviction, and, and that's wonderful. I'm not saying it's unimportant. I'm simply saying, please, let's keep the main thing the main thing. When we get to heaven, is there going to be a line of masters and non-masters? Is there going to be social distancing in heaven? Is God going to require a vaccine passport to get to heaven? Okay, good, just checking. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. Job chapter 31, we're going to get there here in just a second. Jesus uh, made it clear after the time of Job, in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, in this world you will have what? Suffering. That's right, uh, suffering, and another word that's used in the NIV is trouble. But he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus already knew we'd have all kinds of trouble and suffering. He didn't name them all specifically because he knew they'd always be different. It might be war. It might be famine. It might be economic downturn. It might be pandemics. He said, you're going to have suffering. I'm already overcome. That's why I, it, it kind of shocks us to read a story like Job where Satan says, I want to test that man. And God says, you know what? Go ahead. And in our minds, we're immediately a little confused, thinking, shouldn't God make my life easy for me? And we forget, what did Jesus tell his disciples? He didn't just say, in this world you have trouble. He says, if you're going to follow me, you can expect brother to turn in brother. You can expect trouble if you follow me. If the closer you walk with God, you can expect to be persecuted. You can expect to be tested. So if you came here this morning looking to make your life easier, we've got two exit doors and there's other churches that will give you a false gospel and they probably don't open for another 30 minutes. So get there while there's time. But if, if you are genuinely trying to seek the truth of God from the Word of God, well, I've got great news for you. There will be trouble in the world, but Christ will be with you in the middle of that trouble. What does Psalm 23 say? I've said this for almost every Sunday for the last month. The Lord is my shepherd, right? I should not want. And what do we hear? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's the good news this morning. That's the good news this morning. If you're physically able, would you mind standing with me as we read uh, Job chapter 31, just as a sign of respect for the reading of God's holy word, if you're physically able. Job chapter 31, verses 35 through 40. Now, th this is Job speaking. Job has laid his case before the Lord. He said, please tell me why I'm suffering. Please tell me why this has happened. And he's not getting any answers. He doesn't curse the Lord. He doesn't reject the Lord, but he's still not understanding. Job chapter 31, starting in verse 35. Oh, that I had someone to hear me. A sign now for my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I, I put it on like a crown. In other words, he's saying, I, I'm fine pleading guilty if you tell me what the charge is. I would give him an account of my every step. I would present it to him as a ruler. If my land cries out against me and all its furrows are wet with tears, if I have devoured its yield without payment or broken the spirit of its tenants, then let briars come up instead of wheat and stink wheat instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. You may be seated as I pray. Heavenly Father, we are honored to be able to call you Father. We do this through Jesus' blood. Thank you for this family that surrounds us. Lord, you do offer joy and suffering. You don't offer a fleeting happiness. You offer a genuine, lasting joy. <clears throat> a deep-seated satisfaction in you that things are under your control, even when they feel out of ours. Thank you for an example like Job. 
An example that sometimes good people get tested. And it's not an indication of your wrath or displeasure. It's just an indication that this is a messed up world. So we thank you for how you redeem this messed up world. How you bring love and recovery and healing in this world. And Lord, sometimes you don't bring it in this world. Sometimes you bring it in the next world. But Lord, you bring it. You're faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I, I could have made this sermon series a lot longer and gone verse by verse through the book of Job. Have you ever read through the entire book of Job? It's a lot of nonsense philosophy in the middle, where Job's friends are all trying to interrogate him and figure out, Job, what did you do wrong? You, you'd imagine Job laying out on the therapist's couch. <clears throat> Job, did your parents love you when you were little? <coughs> did you ever lose a family pet, Job? They're interrogating him, trying to say, Job, there's got to be a reason God's punishing you. Let's figure it out. Why do you think his friends were so intent on figuring out why Job was being punished? Why do you think his friends who came to mourn with him and who were present with him, why do you think they quickly became obsessed with figuring out what caused Job's crisis? Why do you think they cared so much? They didn't want it to happen to them. You've had that conversation, right? Wow, I'm really, I'm really sorry you had that accident, you know, and then later you're like, so so what, what were you doing exactly? Were you texting and driving? Or were you what, what was the were the roads wet? I mean, you know, you try to figure out, like, you don't want it to happen to you, and out of the best intentions, Job's friends get lost in this rabbit trail of trying to philosophize uh, Job and just try and psychoanalyze him and that's not very comforting, is it? That's not what Job needed. He just lost everything. But here's what's interesting about Job, and the first point this morning. That winners live in freedom of conscience. Did you hear what we read this morning in the passage? Job said, tell me the charge and I'll wear it on my shoulders. In other words, like you know, criminals might wear a sandwich board that's got their, uh, you know, has their indictment all written out, right? Job's saying, if I did something wrong, just tell me. I'll apologize. I'll make it right. I'll, or I'll show you uh, where maybe you misunderstood me. You know, he's not trying to. He's not trying to doubt God. He's just saying, please, can you tell me? Because in Job's mind, he still believes in retribution theology. He still believes that you uh, you are going to receive consequences for your actions that will always make sense. So if you are a good person and you're generous and you're kind and you're honest that there will be good things happening in your life. And if you are deceitful, greedy, ruthless, that you'll be punished all your life. All you got to do is start reading the Psalms, and you're going to realize that that's not true, because the psalmist David was constantly saying, how come my enemies are having parties? How come my enemies are having a great time, and I'm the one suffering? But he'd get to the end of his psalm and say, you know what, it doesn't matter. I'm going to praise you, O oh Lord. I'm going to extol you. I'm going to lift your name high. You're wonderful. And that's basically Job is learning this lesson in real time. And all of this, what does it keep saying? It said, in all of the things that he said, Job did not what? Waver from his truth. Yeah, he didn't waver. And it also says he didn't sin. So there was nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong when we are going before the Lord saying, okay, I don't get what's going on. Can you help me out here? Lord, what have I done wrong? Well, David even prays that in Psalm 51. He said, hey, search my heart and see if there's any wicked wickedness in me. Go ahead. Let me know. Job chapter 19, verse 4. Job would say, even if I have truly erred, my error lodges with me. Listen, he's got freedom of conscience. He's saying, if I've done something wrong, I'm going to accept responsibility for it. So Job's not out here trying to weasel out from it and make excuses for his behavior. He's saying, please just tell me. I'll make it right. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget one of the churches I, I ministered at. Uh, there was an issue among the church leadership between uh, two people. And I knew it because this one person had come to me with an issue about this church leader. And what does the Bible say? I'm not supposed to take an accusation against another elder without there being another elder present. And this elder knew there were some issues uh, with somebody, but he didn't know who. And so I asked this leader over here, I, I said, well, can't you just forgive this person? And he said, well, you cannot forgive ghosts. He said, you can't forgive ghosts. I said, that's the creepiest thing I've heard all day. Can you explain that? He said, well, if you don't know who's backstabbing you, if you don't know who's feeding bad information about you, if you don't know who's talking bad about you, 
it, 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 it's impossible to forgive. And I said, well, well yes and no. Yes and no. And that situation got worked out, and, and, and uh, those two have worked things out because I was able to, they didn't know it. I set them up. I got them in the same room together. So watch out. Watch out, right? By the way, quick definition. My definition of a rumor is sharing information to which you're not a part of the solution. Sharing information to which you're not a part of the solution. It's none of your business. I'll call you out on it, and you can call me out on it. But here we go. Job is saying, this accusation is a ghost to me. I don't know what I did wrong. I don't know what I did wrong. So I can't confess to something that I don't know about. Does that make sense? And yet Job is saying, Lord, just tell me what it is. I'll apologize and I'll make it right. But he has freedom of conscience. Winners in Christ, like us, we have freedom of conscience. Why? Because we've been given a new life. We've been given a new life. And we are told, if we confess our sins and forsake our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us. So what do we have to lose? If he will forgive us our sins, what do we have to lose in confessing our sins to Christ? What do we have to lose from being like Job in the morning in our prayer time and saying, Lord, before I start my day, I just want to recommit uh, my, my day to you. I'm going to, all this anxiety, I'm worried about this and this and this. I'm going to turn it over to you. And Lord, uh, I just confess to you, I know yesterday I was struggling with, you know, anger. I was struggling with restlessness. And Lord, I'm just going to, uh, I just confess, please help me with that. Is God going to help you with that? Absolutely. I know it's basics. I know it's basics, but we've got to be reminded. Evangelist Greg Laurie said an excuse is a fancy lie dressed up for dinner. An excuse is a fancy lie dressed up for dinner. How much of our Christian life do we spend making excuses for our behavior? Making excuses for our disobedience to the call of the gospel and the Great Commission? How, how often do we have this wonderful, beautiful list of excuses that wouldn't stand one second in heaven? How many of the excuses we make would we actually make to Jesus' face in heaven? Lord, I've just been really tired lately. Lord, I just, I don't know, I'm just nervous about this. Well, Jesus has given us everything we need, and Job saw that. Job, Job said, I know, Lord, you and I can handle this if you just tell me what's going on. But make no mistake, this is a monologue of misery. Job is in misery. He's not pretending everything's okay. He's not putting a fake smile on his face. He's not pretending like he understands what's going on. He's saying, Lord, I am in misery, but I'm still going to praise you. I'll tell you, losers got to play the what-if game, though. Losers got to play the what-if game. Winners have freedom of conscience when there's conviction. <laughs> When, when there's a crisis, winners have freedom of conscience to go, Lord, I need your help. I really, I'm not aware of anything right now that I need to work on. Why? Because you're regularly confessing you're, you're in a good relationship with the Lord, and if he convicts you of something, you're going to deal with it. Losers, however, keep playing the what-if game. And that's what Job's friends were doing. They were turning into losers here because they're saying, but Job, what if you did this? Is that why God punished you? Job, what if, what if you did this? Is that why these bad things have happened? But well, what if, what if? And we even still as believers play that game with Jesus. We say, well, Lord, uh, you know, I want to share the good news, but what if uh, they never talk to me again? What if I lose my job? What if people don't take me seriously anymore? Or the Lord calls us to a move of faith, to take a step of faith in a certain direction and to trust Him by adding something to our calendar or taking it off or doing something with our time. And we say, well, but what if this comes up? Or what if, what if, you name it. We throw the what ifs in there and rather than living in faith, we're living in fear. Well, Job's not doing that. Job's not playing the what if game. He's living in freedom of conscience. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. This would come thousands of years after Job. Isaiah would say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is the Lord speaking through Isaiah. The Lord would say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. You know, I would read this and say, absolutely. There's no way God understands what I'm going through necessarily, or I can understand Him. But that's not what God's saying here through the prophet Isaiah. That's not what He's saying at all. Matter of fact, 
It, the Lord is saying, trust me. I've got you. I will redeem you. I will take care of you. You don't understand everything that's going on. I asked this question last week. Do you think Job had a clue of what was going on between God and Satan right now? Think about it. Put yourself in Job's shoes for a minute. Do you think Job or his friends had any idea that God even said, I, I agree, Job's a righteous man. He, he lives an upright life. <laughs> Isn't that what would matter the most, that God's on your side? Job was struggling. God, are you on my side? And the lesson we're learning, and we'll, we'll finish uh, this series next week, uh, is that God is on our side even when we're being tested. That doesn't mean he caused it, but it means he may have allowed it, and it definitely always means he'll redeem it. And Jesus meant it when he said, those of you who are heavy burdens, what did he say? He said, cast your burdens on me, for my yoke is easy. He didn't say I'm going to take all the weight completely off of you, did he? He didn't say give me, give me all your struggles in life and you'll never have them again. He said no, my yoke is manageable. We can do this together. You ever seen the bumper sticker that says Jesus is my co-pilot? I'm thinking that's a pretty arrogant pilot to tell Jesus to be the co-pilot. <laughs> I want Jesus as my pilot. But I've got control issues, so I don't always like that. I like to think I've got it all together. I have to be reminded like Job that sometimes I'm just not going to understand what's going on, and that's okay. And that's absolutely okay. But please don't miss this. I think we polish up the Bible stories too much. We, we fit them into paintings, we put them into children's books, which is fine, but we make them so clean and crisp and neat, we forget that Job's still in misery. Job's still in misery right now. He's still suffering. Even though his faith is blossoming and we're watching it come to light, he's still suffering. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing, including a stupid virus, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you hear that last part? In other words, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know about you, I hear that and I'm speechless. What do you say in response to that, that nothing can separate us from the love of God? What do you say to that? What tops that? Do you have something better than that? I don't. I've got nothing to sell. I've got nothing better than that. That, that. that is the ultimate to imagine that in Job's situation, nothing separated him from the love of God in that moment, did it? Was Job separated from the love of God in his suffering, yes or no? No, of course not. I know that's simple. I know that's basic. And I appreciate your participation. But I'm asking uh, for you to respond to those questions because we've got to be reminded. But more importantly, people around us need to be reminded. Have you been asked during the last year how a good God could allow good people to suffer bad things? Have you been asked that question? Have you been asked questions about how could God allow this to happen? Well, instead, I would say that's the wrong question. That's not a good question to ask. We, we need to ask uh, what our response is. And we should probably even ask, why is it that nothing can separate us from the love of God? Why is that true? That's a mystery I'll never understand this side of heaven. Why is it that as messed up as I am and this world is, Jesus Christ loved me before I first loved him? And when I turned my life over to him and chose him to be my savior, that he saved me and that he loves me. I don't have the answer. To me, that question's a bigger question than why are bad things happening. I already know the answer to that from Genesis, the fall. But I just want to encourage you this morning, as we move to a time of invitation, and uh, Mary's going to come forward and play uh, our song of invitation, and it is a time that if the Lord's moving on your heart to take a step of faith, if He's moving you to come to know Him as Savior, it's a time to come forward and just make that known to this church family because that's what it is. It's a family of imperfect people serving a perfect God. And so together, we want to keep growing to be more and more like Him. It's a question of trusting God when we're in misery. I don't know how many of you are in misery this morning, but I know just because you showed up to church doesn't mean you got your act together first. 
I mean, it seems like I think everybody showered before you came here, at least. That's a good start. All right? I mean, it wasn't always a listen in the old days. I heard some stories about anyway. Okay. We'll save that for another day. But we can't, it, coming to church, sometimes we get cleaned up and dressed up to come to church, and some of us shave, I don't anymore. But we get cleaned up and we come to church, and, but we think in our minds somewhere we think, I've got to get my life together before I go to church so that people know God's on my side. And I would say, hold up, look at the story of Job. Job is scraping himself still with pottery, and he is in rags of clothes, in a completely humble position, and he is still loved by God, and God is still on his side, and he's still on God's side. He could never get cleaned up enough. We could never get cleaned up enough to come before God. Jesus does that. God does that. Even if you're in misery or you have misery coming your way, trust him. Confess to him. Share with him. Give him a chance to move in your life. Because even in misery, Christ still brings redemption. Please stand with us if you're physically able as we sing our song of invitation. A time to come forward, a time to meditate on what the Lord's speaking to your heart. Mm -hmm.